Ben B. Shiva and I are delighted to bring you today David and Kim Martin. This is a meeting that's been orchestrated specifically to share with Australians um, wisdom from David and Kim and to really talk into the things that are happening in Australia right now and give some sort of direction to how we might be as we move forward. Australia has been in the midst of the most intense experience as we traverse this COVID experience under a tyrannical and draconian government. People have been holding space, surviving financially, mentally and emotionally, but it's been challenging and challenging us to a depth that we have not experienced before. Some are waking and finding their voice. Wonderful lights have actually begun to shine but many, many more feel helpless and hopeless. White Australians have never <coughs> had to fight for their own country <coughs> this way. The Aboriginal community has been there before though, and their current plight concerns us greatly. The plight of all Australians is the reason we are here today with David and Kim. Thank you so much. Lovely you to be welcome. here. It's so, so lovely to be here. Yes, it's Thanks been, for having us. <laughs> it's been our absolute pleasure. We've been very excited. Let me introduce to you da uh, David Martin. I've known David for perhaps six years now, five or six years. David Martin is a man awake. He's on a mission putting humanity back into humans. He knows how to be the difference that makes a difference. He knows how to effect organizational change and he's written a book called lizards eat butterflies a little round of applause there <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yay davo <laughs> he's been a guiding light to countless thousands indeed millions over the last two years especially with his wife kim he runs a four-day workshop called fully live a program to build humanity not dependency David has been, among many other things, analysing patents for over 20 years, including the novel coronavirus. He has repeatedly been interviewed by doctors and scientists, interested parties globally this last two years, bringing us the truth about matters that count. Today, our conversation is directly centred on Australia and our pathway through our current experience. Um, thank you so much, David. Um, at the outset, I would like um, to just reflect back to uh, your documentary, Future Dreaming. And one of the things that you said in there, and I think this is a good way to start, is you said we have killed off the wild type in the genome. We've hybridized that expression of humanity. And we have been trained not to open to our full self-expression. You likened yourself at that point to being an alarm clock. And my question is, how can we be creating more alarm clocks around this theme? Well, that's a very interesting question. And the way I would approach it is very simple. I think all of us live in a space where we have a deep awareness of an intuitive sense, a stirring somewhere in our soul that feels when we know we are encountering something that is energetically malaligned to humanity. I think each one of us know it. Each one of us have that feeling that something is wrong, something's off. And we have been indoctrinated and we have been brainwashed into rejecting that intuition and favoring when we feel like there's something off, we feel that there is someone else that should explain why our feeling is wrong. <clears throat> and I think the best way to start waking up the latent capacity of each and every one of us is to recognize that when we're triggered with that reflex, where we have a sense that something is wrong or something is off, rather than looking outward, we should be looking inward. We should be trying to build the muscle that allows us to trust that still small stirring that lives inside of us that says, hey, when, when it feels off, it is off. Mm -hmm. 
And when we try to go to a place where we ask for the expert to rationalize why our perception, why our intuition is wrong, we should immediately interdict that impulse. Now, we know that we've been conditioned to have the impulse. And so we've been conditioned to say, well, clearly there's something wrong with my observation. But rather than thinking that there's something wrong with our observation, we need to be able to step into a space where we hold ourselves accountable for the fact that if the impulse has shown up in us, it's right. Something is off. And then what we need to be doing is rather than looking to an expert to somehow at least anesthetize that feeling, if not fully knock us out, which is what unfortunately the majority of people are doing, we actually get used to living in the painful reality that each of those stimuli is there to serve us and it's there to help us. And you know what I said, Pat, in the film, when I talked about the fact that we've killed off the wild type in our in our societies is that through the cunning use of torture, through the execution of heretics, from the extermination of First Nations people all around the world, what we've done is we've said that the doctrine of conquest and the doctrine of dominion, which places someone as the expert, someone as the authority over everyone else, that system is the system which has metastasized into the cancer that is killing society right now. And the beautiful thing is we have an opportunity right now as that social structure is in fact dying, we have an opportunity to offer what life looks like. So that's why I'm excited about conversations like this because it does bring out the opportunity for us to re-engage that part of our soul that part of our mind that part of our intuition that most of us have been conditioned to silence mm. yeah. beautiful david and yeah Pat, i was just saying before we before you guys jumped on that we here certainly in australia and of course kim vegan aussie is um we've never had to fight for our country we've always gone off and fought for other people's wars and involved ourselves in those battles and of course the original you know the invasion that's happened here with the originals people as well which they're going through another set of incredible yes. performers right now through all of this uh we've been i mean i'd love to get your perspective on the, the the idea that we've actually been groomed as a culture down here on this little remote island in the middle of nowhere surrounded by water almost like alcatraz we've been exactly. groomed to be you know she'll be right mate and why do today what you can do tomorrow and all that sort of attitude and we've been very lucky with things like medicare and centrelink and government support compared to you know, it's, it's medicare most definitely compared to the, the state so what, what's your perspective on that that's all been by deliberate design to get us to a space now where we're just kind of dumbed down or numbed down? I think there's a piece in that too where people, um, they think that it's, you know, it's always been happening over there. Like it's, it's in America, they're having all the trouble or other countries are, or other countries are having it and we're perceived this safe place, the lucky country. Um, and yes, we haven't had to have many battles where we've had to really toughen up, really work together, create community, um, just haven't had that experience. It's always been, we've been looked after and, you know, they'll just fix it out there. And I think also too, it was going on over in America or the, the COVID situation for far longer than it's obviously been happening in Australia. And then I think, well, from what I was being told by friends and family, they thought they might fly under the radar and not be very much affected and then suddenly you know Australia was just absolutely hit harder than most places and um so for a country that hasn't had to you know dig really deep you know unless they were supporting other wars and I'm not not diminishing that that's been hideous for people but um it, can't, it came as a shock and a surprise and then there's they played on the mentality of oh we just want to go back to normal and things like that so we'd quickly succumb to what was going on added to the fact that um, they perceived that the government was looking after them in the initial stages by closing off all the borders and doing harsh me measures and not letting anyone in or out and then so then by trusting the government because they looked after us initially or perceived to be they've gone blindly along with any of the measures um, for their own well-being and to follow it so they can quickly get back to normal and quickly let it be over there and away from us not this time like every country now has to dig deep and has to find their strength 
and unity and um, find their unique thing and it'll make you know there's going to be some tough amazing people coming together um and it is it's literally a fight for your life um there's no going back to our normal there was a whole lot that's been revealed also that is was never normal and you know a lot of uh, what people thought was um, a truth and they were looked after there quickly seeing there was a lot of um, collusions and underhanded things going on for a long 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 time it's shining a light on a ton of stuff mm -hmm. so yeah and being away being in Ireland and New Zealand um, being away from everyone it is has become like an Alcatraz where you know the censorship is extreme people don't know a lot of the information and again another reason why they're blindly going along with things like the experiment that they're doing in those island countries like Australia and New Zealand and being far away from everyone, they're getting away with it. Mm. Mm. And that's hideous. And it's very sad to watch. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to just point out, I mean, I had the unfortunate reality of being in Australia when the real crimes were being committed and not a single Australian seemed to care at all. Mm. Um, in 2018, when I was having the cybersecurity conference in Melbourne, I talked about the fact that, Australia led the way in seriously more than any communist country in the world, the most intrusive cyber detection, cyber intrusion policies that have been promulgated anywhere on earth. And not a single Australian seemed to raise their voice in any coherent way. I keep being reminded that, that Australia has this beautiful public health service, except I pointed out many times that the Medicare system in Australia has been a data collection exercise uh, where every Australian is not getting free medical care. Every pharmaceutical company is actually getting free access to the lab rats called Australians. This, this, this BS that says, oh, we've got free health care and we can go to any hospital and we can access any health care is a blatant lie. It has been a blatant lie since it was set up. This has been an opportunity as we see all the way back to the late 90s where the Medicare system in Australia has been sold to the pharmaceutical industry. You are a giant Petri dish for industrial pharmaceutical companies. And I keep being told, well, isn't it wonderful we have free health care? You're not having free health care. You are the biggest drug dealing, drug pushing, and most egregiously, the most studied, most prodded, most poked population on earth. And, and people celebrate that as though somehow or another... This is the beautiful benefit of living in a quasi-socialized state. It blows my mind that, I mean, your Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, was hand-delivered financial fraud information that I had delivered by one of his closest friends in 2018 on the fraud that was taking place between the Germans, the French, and the Australians. And he did not only nothing, but the message that he sent back through the brigadier general who was his liaison for procurement, the message he sent back was a warning that says, if you speak out, bad things happen to whistleblowers in this country. Hmm. I mean, this thing, has been a, this thing has been a police state, brutality state, and the current prime minister is in fact willfully in possession of evidence of his own government's misdeeds. Hmm. And not a single Australian seemed to care about it. And I raised this issue in 2017, 2018, and I was threatened, not welcomed, by pointing that out. Yeah, wow, well, David, thank you for sharing that because uh, yeah, the, the we've got a lot of grassroots new <clears throat> um, political parties coming up, which have the best intentions, I'm sure, and they're, they're all, you know, uh, passionate Australians that are wanting you know, freedom and um, you know, to raise the consciousness of this country and connect blacks and whites and everybody else, all the, all the different cultures that have made Australia the amazing place that it is. But I reckon the whole system just needs to be completely freaking dismantled and not replace it with another system, like bring in, right. which is what we want to talk about too, you know, bring in the originals, bring in the tribal law, restore yep. the land to the people whose land it actually is and not just replace a broken system with another version of that. Well, and I think if we think about it, I mean, every time I had a public meeting in Australia, I nearly jumped up and strangled whoever was the MC or the moderator when they would get up and do their pathetic, we honor the ancestral, you know, custo custodians of the, of the community or of the land that we're on. You could not more thoroughly dishonor an, a First Nation individual 
than to do 99% of what followed the we are honoring the people whose land we're standing on. I mean, whether that was, you know, paving roads, whether that was digging tunnels, whether that was building, you know, industrial parks or anything else, saying you honor somebody and then desecrating the thing that they hold yeah. dear is not honoring, it's desecration. And it's time that Australia stopped telling itself the lies that they recite with this dogmatic system that says, you know, it's not the lucky country, it's actually a penal colony. It's a penal colony that was a site of genocide. And it's actually currently a giant industrial nexus for the worst of the industrial exploitations of the industrialized world. 80 plus percent of your dependency of your economy is based on a single exporting counterparty and it happens to be China. So you do have that going for you. And, and, and you have this unholy you know, alliance that unfortunately lives between Australia and, you know, the, the, the UK and the United States, where we're, we're insisting that you are our largest aircraft carrier in the Pacific. And if we treated Australia the way the US actually sees Australia, which is it's a giant aircraft carrier sitting off the coast of the South China Sea, and the only reason we care about it at all in the US is because it has tactical value, um, we'd actually start having a more realistic picture of what's really going on. And I think Australians would be rightful in their frustration that maybe this story we're telling ourselves is a refrain we're echoing so we can't hear the drumbeat of the abuses that are happening. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, we've, we've had the drum, the, uh, the ability to respond to that drumbeat completely beaten out of us, David. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. To mm. just make us do, you know, to literally bend over and and receive like that. Pat, do you want to respond to that in regards to what we were talking before as well, with the, the, you know, the atrocities with uh, the Rio Tinto company, for example, blowing yeah. up a 40,000 yeah. year old, two of them, sites in Duke and Gorge, and many of these things, these sacred sites, I mean, there's been some elders this week, um, David and Kim speaking out, uh, I think four or five of them on a video saying that um, for the government to actually come onto sacred land and set up their COVID testing uh, tents, is a violation of human rights and all the absolutely as well. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, they've been arriving at six a.m. in townships, um, endeavouring to you know get onto properties. And I do understand some of the Aboriginal communities have effectively blocked their progress, but I know others have also you know it's it's arrived as a surprise and um, yeah. they've not been well prepared. Um, one of the things you said in in the movie, and I've heard you say it since, the divine only lets us see something we can do something about. And I love that because it really doubly awakened me to um, really get present to, right, <laughs> um, you know, I've received this and um, now it's mine. A company here that I worked with recently um, their catch cry was, if you see it, own it. Right. Big business, 30,000 people. Um, and I presented to work with 450 of their leaders and they all embodied that. And it's my first mm. experience in 20 years of seeing so many in a heightened state of consciousness, ready to step into awkward and difficult conversations. Um, and over, over a 15 month period, I saw evidence of how they do that. Um, but they've been one, you know, it, it's kind of a small group um, that I've borne witness to anyway. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think that my view of this issue is that we often see gross miscarriages of justice or abuses of individuals or groups. And we sometimes sit in wonder around why we're seeing something that clearly provokes consternation inside of our own experience, but we see people going along with um, their life as though they're, they're either unaware or completely callous to what's going on. And one of the things that concerns me is often what it does is it leads to a second injury, which is the injury of consternation or disappointment with the absence of humanity. And so what happens is you sit there going, I can't believe somebody let that happen. 
Um, the reason I love that phrase, Pat, is because for me, it's a constant reminder to have mercy for those who are blind, either literally or blind from the standpoint of having their moral compass so clearly malaligned that they do not see themselves in agency of acting in the best interest of humanity. And I think, you know, Kim and I have experienced this countless times over this last now 22 months that we've been in the public eye on this particular topic, where we sometimes sit back at, at, at the end of a day or at the end of a conference and we go, you know, were we the only ones that saw what just happened? Yeah. And, and the answer is yes, we were the only ones that saw it. Mm. And rather than putting that in a place of judgment, what I know both of us have done is tried to reflect on what can we do to evidence mercy for those who are doubly injured. Their consciousness have been seared and their eyes have been blinded. And rather than seeing that as another thing to go after, I think what we've tried to do is find a way to say, you know, how do we change our communication style? How do we come up with better metaphors? And I give Kim a ton of credit. I mean, you realize how many of our videos I've been told are unprofessional. Um, they're unprofessional because Kim's smiling or she does something with my bald head where she has chickens come out of that or whatever. <laughs> That's a bit um, of fun. <laughs> but the funny thing is yeah. when we meet people, when we meet people around the country, and when we hear from people around the world, it's that very humanity that is, in fact, the yes. thing that starts building the bridge yep. for them to go, oh, hold on a second. They're real people. They're serious and they're real. And they can take they themselves not too seriously, which yeah. is, yeah. which is, I think. There's a lot of seriousness. <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's a critical part of the story. And I think, you know, Kim's been a superstar in adding a heart and humanity to the rather, you know, monotonous drone of facts that I seem to be able to hemorrhage all the time. <laughs> it's authenticity, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is authenticity and people <laughs> need that and people need to, or don't need to, it's good to live, live by example and especially a couple. And, you know, if you're going to be given facts, you'd rather have it in an enjoyable way than, you know, you could read stuff off different sources, but, you know, two real people mucking around sometimes and presenting stuff is, um, well, Someone's really having bad. our dog walk through. It's a bit of fun. Well, and I think it's worth you pointing out. I mean, Kim, I, I won't spoil it, but you actually wanted to know what humanity is capable of. Yeah. And it turns out, you know, be careful what you ask for, right? Absolutely. That's a uh, that's a big thing. I am. Um, that's all your fault. You know, I've, <laughs> I've had a thirst for, and I would often say, you know, I want to know what human beings are capable of and didn't actually think mm. or um, put a fine print in my wish. <laughs> And, you know, that can bring with it the best and worst of humanity, of course. And I, but I was thinking, but I was thinking just the good bits, you know, what's amazing things can we do with our mind and hearts and souls? And it's like, well, there's also a really dark side of humanity. And yeah, definitely got to experience a lot of that. Well, you've got the world's patent greater understanding too yeah. of everybody. The expert right next to you. So next time, maybe just get him to look at the fine print and all the spiritual. Yeah, <laughs> before I send the wish out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, on and that note too. Um, you know, obviously, the the bigger picture is that we create unity for everybody. Unity, consciousness, right. coming together, rising above uh, uh, trauma, you know, our generational trauma, our own personal stuff that we've carried through from lifetimes, whatever you want to, you know, see that perspective. And being the the financial whiz that you are, David, as well, in relation to what I'm sure happens with many original peoples and you know, other cultures around the world in what's regarded as the money story. It's a big situation here in Australia and both Pat and I have spoken about that and we've both been witness to personally as well um, being involved in situations where the money story has become an issue, a problem, a block, most definitely when we've yeah. been dealing with originals and, and obviously big corporations and governments, etc. So uh, one of the things that we've both spoken about for a while as well is that, you know, white culture, we've all got our stuff that we still need to clear and heal, but so does do all the mobs here in Australia as well. And this is from people that we've spoken to and elders that we've spoken to and aunties, yeah. uncles, et cetera. So how do we get past that hurdle? If we can, How can we reach unity consciousness whilst we've still got two essentially groups of, of people and cultures that are still divided within their own spheres? Well, so this goes into a deep 
project, Kim and I just finished up a wonderful workshop um, just two weeks ago mm. um, where we did a very painful journey through the conversation of rape. Mm. And what we tried to do was unpack that the construct of rape as a, as a social um, energetic is actually not dissimilar at all to the social construct of colonization and conquest. Um, you change some of the dynamics, but actually not even that many of the dynamics. What you do is you go into a, a situation and the very first thing you do is you project onto the, the, the target. And, and that could be a woman, that could be a man, but it also could be a land. It could be a forest, it could be a river, it could be an ocean, it could be anything. And you project onto it, not its essence, but what you see you can exploit from it. So the first step that you take is not seeing a thing for what it is. It's seeing a thing for what you can take from it. And if we go back and we look at what the story of Australia is, that is the story of Australia, like the story of most colonialized locations where what happens is we bring in energy that says we're not going to listen to what you have right and remember as much as i know there are people in new south wales who will be very upset when i say this you know your first fleet wasn't the first fleet 100 years earlier the dutch were sailing into perth um so so even our stories don't have the convenience of being true but but when you actually look at what happened one of the things that the, the early Dutch saw in Western Australia was how amazing the agriculture sophistication was of the original peoples in, in what's now Western Australia, because they were actually farming the marshes. They were not hunters and gatherers, which is the, the wonderful British story that is told of original peoples. The, the, the folks in Western Australia around the marshes of Perth were actually quite elaborate. They had figured out how to deal with reeds and marshes. They had figured out how to deal with irrigation systems. They were very much a sophisticated agrarian society. And this is when the Dutch found them 100 years before the British even let set foot on, on Australia. So if you go and look at the actual record of history, what happens is that we see this impulse, and that's why the metaphor and the reality of rape is so important. This is, this is projecting a dominion story onto someone who is or something who is beneath your ability to sit and first examine what are they doing right? What are they doing that could inform you? What are they doing that could benefit your life? Um, if you look at the current economy of Australia, it is dreadful to think that Really, you know, 80% of the economy, and if and no matter how you slice and dice it, even though, you know, I know there are people who are in glass high rises in all of the major cities who are going to go, well, our service industry is very strong. No, it isn't. It serves the extractive industry. Australia is an extraction story. It is what can we take? Mm -hmm. What can we take from the land? What can we take from the people? What can we take, take, take? And until we get the, to the place, Denby, where we can have that conversation, which is we need to go back and ask the question, as I did when I was out in the outback in WA, where I was in Kalgoorlie and all these places way out in the hinterlands in, in WA, we need to go back and ask, well, what are the stories that we've ignored? What are the stories of the sandalwood? What are the stories mm -hmm. of, the, of the scrub brush? What are the stories of how animal migration happens? What, what are these winged things that show up in all of the, the original stories and song lines? What are those things? And what is it that we can learn from them? Because inside of these, we may have, are you ready for this? A local cure for COVID. <gasps> Shock. No. Yeah. Not a natural thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, 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 you actually might find that some of the local teas, <laughs> You know, some, some of some of the essential oils, some of the things that were part of the of the communities that actually knew how to live there may, God forbid, actually help solve our problems. What? <laughs> you know, but but that's the point. The point is the minute we actually step into the, the preamble problem, which is the preamble problem is we dictate to the earth and we dictate to its inhabitants what they're worth 
rather than taking the step back and saying, hold on a minute, what can we learn? Mm -hmm. What is the thing that is of greater value that we haven't even considered? Because all we've considered is coal and iron ore, and that's all we considered. Yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant, David. Oh, sorry, Pat, I've just got to, on that thread, I want to add to that. that cool? Topic. Yeah. Okay. Um, so brilliant because, okay, so when we think of um, bring out the environmental aspect here now, when we see the whales, when people are whaling, we see the whales beaching themselves, all this horrendous thing. And there is the there is a spiritual perspective to that, that these sentient beings are actually sacrificing themselves in some way to raise attention and uh, awareness to those horrors. So people will actually start to care and do something about it. Okay. So there are a few people within the different groups of, of elders here in Australia. And I've just heard this through feedback and I've had vague sort of conversations with my connections as well. But there are a handful of elders here that say that uh, the invasion was a response to an energetic misalignment that actually needed to be corrected, much like a disease that we manifest to create, you know, to address an imbalance. So that's a huge <laughs> a bomb to throw into the conversation yeah. even, um, to contemplate but would you like to throw your incredible perspective on that as well what's well, interesting kim and i had the great fortune of spending time this past um i'd say summer but you guys are winter so um <clears throat> your winter a few months ago we were in south dakota and we had a beautiful the time Indians. with the lakota oh, um and we spent some amazing time kim got to spend an afternoon with some of the most magical uh, Lakota elders mm. and just an amazing, amazing conversation in Rapid City. And it was fascinating to hear their perspective on this, this question of whether or not there is some sort of bigger thing at play, some sort of realignment of energies and, and sources. And, and what was fascinating was for their story, it was not just the defiling of the land, but it was very much a call in their communities to reinvigorate the story of the way men and women treat each other. Mm. Um, so it was very fascinating. I mean, was I, I didn't know where the conversation was going to go. Mm. But I think that if we, if we look at a lot of what um, original cultures can teach us right now, we can really open up the possibility that the, you know, the force shutdown, the stay-at-home orders, have actually highlighted some really deep dysfunction in personal relationships mm -hmm. and in social interactions and otherwise leading, unfortunately, to some very horrific abuses and harm and domestic violence and things like that. But as that energy has, has surfaced, I think there is an opening where we can start healing ourselves and our relationships and then move to the healing of our lands and our narratives. And, and it was very clear that that seemed to be what the Lakota were talking about too. But to start with um, the relationships. Yeah. And that had the effect on everything, which it does. It's life force. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, one of the things in there is <clears throat> uh, we are white Australians lack culture. And by that, I mean, we don't have um, any ceremonies, rituals, mm. um, reverence, um we're not steeped in storytelling in no. the way that these other indigenous cultures are and for me like the last 20 years um there i've injected <laughs> so much of that into the work that i do and mm -hmm. and seen the magic it creates it, like this it, it gives you a vessel in which to place reverence and you know reverence for the for you know as we do for the small so we do for the for the large s um and learning i've been practicing the virtues for 20 years and mm -hmm. it's all about languaging and i love the contrast that you and kim have in your languaging you know <laughs> and it's a perfect compliment because it's quite different and um it wakes us up to difference, but, but do you want to, do you want to touch to on that a little beauty. bit? Because, because that's actually a really great, I mean, Pat, it's a great insight. And yeah, it is a very good I, insight. I would love for you to comment on the journey you've been on just even the last several weeks and months around that. Yeah. Um, 
David and I are very, you know, have a lot of differences um, in the way that we see the world, how we communicate and that kind of thing. Um, but we do share, you know, the same values in regards to a deep humanity, you know, wanting to, to change the world for better and be best versions of ourselves. But you could, as a couple, kind of go, my goodness, communicating um, even together in our relationship has been a huge challenge. As you know, David's very wordy and meticulous and precise. No, nobody knows that. that that's, <laughs> I know that's you new just knowledge. Broke, broken first here yes, on your interview. No one knew that before that. And I am not like that. I am um, very picture orientated feeling and thought. Um, and with and the way I see the world is, um, yeah, just very different. And now us trying to be in each other's shoes and have empathy for each other's experience and what we're trying to express, um, instead of being, you know, frustrated by it, it's kind of like, oh, hang on a minute, let me try walking in your shoes. And, and so I'm trying on more um, of a writer's kind of hat and being more slowing down and having more precision with language and how I speak, which is great. And that kind of refinement, you know, anyone could benefit from. And then, um, you know, David being stepping into, you know, a more of a creative feeling type shoes and then going, well, hang on, Kim must mean because it's her, this. And it's, and that has helped David with a lot of his um, presentations because when he runs them by me, we make sure, you know, it can appeal to all. Because if you can yeah. capture all of that, that's when you're going to make the most effect. You can't just keep yes. talking to the intellectual type wordy people it has to capture feeling essence and the whole like everything matters in it and we've been able to really learn from each other and um refine those aspects and yeah. um help share that with the world and help more people hear That's hear a different way and, and reflect a different way instead of highlighting differences and going oh it's just impossible it's like hang on a minute there's differences for a reason so you can grow and learn yeah that's beautiful, guys. And it's the masculine and the feminine within both of you that is complementing the other and, and awakening, you know, what is maybe not out of balance, but needed to sort of rise up a little bit more in one another. So you've been therapizing in one another whilst on the world stage. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> it, it could be a pay-per-view. We could actually turn this into a, you know, a, a hidden camera all across the house. It'd yeah. Be <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> it might be. Yeah, little... maybe not. We have enough reality TV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your 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 use of language, David, and your thoughts around it have um, been a key um, intrigue point, if you like, in my association with you. <clears throat> and I remember at the launch of Future Dreaming in New Zealand, um, I met Kaya, the producer. And he said to me, oh, Pat, he said, David will love to meet you, joyologist. He said, um, <clears throat> and then later we talked and, and you spoke of how we won't be David Martin or Pat Armitstead, perhaps in the future. We will be called that by which we are wanting to express. Right. And it was like, oh, so I'll be joyful empowerment. Um, and our thinking when we consider ourselves like that in the past i've used the word entrepreneur and you've made comment um i've heard you make comment at times about how that word actually creates separatism yep so you know being ultra mindful now about our language and um what it means like uh, i've always wanted to be fully self-expressed <clears throat> but along that pathway for a while, I thought, oh, I could be an entrepreneur. That sounds fancy. Um, yeah. But the, the, it's not it's not as sexy <laughs> necessarily as we think. Um, mm. And it's just it's just a word. So um, choosing our language and then choosing our expression and working with our gifts. Uh, I think this is pivotal for now. A lot of people don't know where their strengths lie. And now is the unique opportunity to really identify and then harness that and then harness the collective too. To, I worked with a horsewoman once and she said to me, Pat, if I'm leading a team of six horses, she said, I know by the feel of what's in the reins coming back from each of those horses, I know what each animal wants. And right. it's like I get a picture of leadership now 
in that fashion, we need to be so sensitive to really be feeling uh, what's going on here and being able to um, be, be responsive to all of those threads and receptive and responsive. Mm. If we look back at the Mesopotamian and, and early Assyrian cultures, we have a beautiful set of references to the fact that leadership was something that was recognized by a community, not taken by the powerful. You weren't a leader until you were worthy of being followed. You weren't a leader because you got out in front and said, I'm the leader. And, mm -hmm. and what we have, unfortunately, is we have over the last really 2,000 years, and I'm being generous, it's really 1,800 years, We've turned that whole system on its head, which is now by fiat, we tell people that they are being led um, and you don't really have much say in it. They, they're the ones that tell you where the land is that you can farm. They're the ones that tell you what you can do on Sunday or Saturday or Friday or whatever else. They'll, they'll tell you how to live your life, but they won't ever do anything to evidence the merit. It says that the, what they're offering is anything other than our ironically protection against their vindication and their vengeance if you're on the wrong side um so so it's fascinating to see that we've we've entirely ruined the notion of leadership to suggest that leaders are people who somehow command and control and manipulate and coerce um, which by the way i think I think I just gave the job description for every leader that is subject to anyone listening to this interview. Um, I don't think there's a single one of them that actually, if stood on their own merits, would be given any mantle of leadership by anyone. Uh, the fact is that they're propped up by the people who control them and they are willing to take whatever they want from the public, but not a single member of the public would, given all the alternatives, ever put them in a place of leadership. And I think it's important to realize that. But I think at the same breath, we need to be very, very kind and conscientious about the fact that, you know, what's going to happen tonight when I finish this interview, I'm going to go to sleep. <coughs> I'm going to know that I have done my, my level best, my level best to be the fullness of humanity in this day. And when I fall asleep, I'm not going to be worried about what somebody's going to find out about me overnight. Um, I know that Scott Morrison does not share that pillow. I know that when he falls asleep, I know that he has so much and I know what he has. So the worst part about it is I know what he's not talking about. I know the evidence that I know I've given him about crimes that he's done nothing about. I, I don't know what it's like to, to live in a world where I can't put my head on my pillow at night and actually peace sleep in, in peace. Yourself. Yeah. Um, and so I have to have at some level a, a degree of sympathy for a person who has opted into the delusion of leadership at the expense of their humanity. Mm. Um, and I think that that's what's going to transform this event. And by the way, whether it does it in a year or five years or 10 years, I'm actually absolutely indifferent about the time horizon. What I know this event has done is that it has put into stark relief. The fact that we have people who only have as their tool of leadership, suppression and coercion and violence. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is there are a number of people who are going, that is a broken model and we need to look at something new. And the great news is it's at a big enough scale. It's at a systemic level sufficient to run the risk that maybe enough of us are going to go, yeah, you know what? That that time had its run right it had its 1800 years but that time is over it's time for leadership to mean worthy of following mm -hmm. not the biggest you know the biggest stick in the room yeah totally david and, and i literally mm -hmm. spoke about that a couple of weeks ago pat might have seen me doing a live saying that uh, this whole thing with uh, you know the tall poppy syndrome kim you'll be familiar with here in australia when anybody gets any sense of or um, no, knock them down yes, they knock them down chop them down and um and criticize them and bring them back down yep. to their level or whatever uh, yeah. and i was saying that i don't even like the word these influences and you'd be able to relate to this david too with you no know, people following you it's like i don't want followers i want supporters 
Like yes. Languaging, even just that little button shouldn't just be yeah. follow me. It should be support me in my word and my vision of yeah, what, what can I do as well to help you. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it takes the higher just cheer for you. stuff out of it. Totally. Mm. And that all ties back into before that Pat was saying as well. And with our originals here, it's like listening. They have it, they say it to us all the time. Dadiri, let's listen. Everyone's hearing stuff, but no one's actually yeah. listening. And yeah. then yeah. integrating that that and and then and expressing that in their own way. So um what's the solution mr martin please <laughs> <laughs> 25 words well, or kim, kim why don't you why don't you tell people about what happened this weekend because that was beautiful i think it starts with you've hit the nail on the head storytelling and a deep humanity and this story will just touch your heart and soul i know we already touched on relationships and looking at yourself first and the people that are around you and creating community and especially starting with yourself and actually setting an example, like fully living and don't let them, don't let anybody take away your sovereignty or how you want to live and stand strong in that. We had this most amazing experience. And if anyone gets the chance, I could not more highly recommend going to covidcon21.com. Mm. So covidcon21.com and have a look at, um, there was amazing speakers. Um, David's one was just obviously the showstopper um, and that was just an amazing, amazing talk that in and of itself was mind blowing. And in a nutshell, it was a new way of stepping forward. It was, um, people are now saying, what is the way forward? What can a, not a new world or a repairing the old or anything like that. What if you could just start, what if it was never a beautiful, amazing place where everything was considered and, and, and people and the environment and, and just everything was in, in, in harmony and all of the dimensions were, were taken into consideration. And, you know, integral accounting is a, a, a way that David's been trying to get that message across, but it's only now, it has obviously got, got across in, in many ways, but it's kind of like sometimes things have a time and a place. Yeah. And now, you know, for, it's been 20 years that David's been or more teaching it. And now it's kind of like it's having its life force because um, it takes into consideration a, a, a world and a humanity that actually does look at everything. Um, nothing is left, um, of course, includes, you know, money, people, knowledge, you know, well-being, um, commodity and technology, like all the all of the main areas. And that was what um, David started to get people to start thinking of new questions and a new lens on life because it can't be another person going, well, this is how you should live. Here's, here is a template. Take these things into consideration. We can help guide you, but we want your you to all start thinking differently and you to come up with things. But a lot of people, because of education and religion or various other things coming at you, like people haven't had an opportunity to really think and sit down and tune into themselves and go, you know, what's, what's possible, what matters to me and what actually is in my soul. And those are the things where, you know, your, your genes ignite and all the different things to actually reignite the wild types in you. Cause it's always there. It's just got to have an impulse to, to ignite it. And there was a David threw a big lightning bolt in it to ignite it. And people were, you know, with David's help, just, steering them in thinking in different ways and that that was just an amazing speech so you can see that and then what unfolded the next night was just another layer of absolute beautiful humanity and i still can't even have words to describe so that they invited uh, the, the the church of glad tidings is the group that held um the conference there They're obviously in california there's not a lot of places that can hold hold events and stuff and they were very generous and the most lovely people you've ever met and they invited us to the next day they were having a, a church service um in the obviously in the same building and said you know we'd like to come you guys to come back so we can give some gratitude so we didn't know what that would all involve and we walked in and um pastor dave and his beautiful beautiful wife cheryl they led their you know the people that were there in this gorgeous tribute and it was just said so beautifully. It took religion out of it, so to speak, and it put in a humanity, a kindness. It wasn't any under the umbrella of any of the dogmas or anything like that. It was pure kindness and pure love. And they just gave reverence and, um, and just like generosity to us, had us up on the stage. They all like actually really put their hands on us and held us and said prayers and lovely things to us all at once. And that was just beyond 
anything I've ever felt before. And then David did a most beautiful thing for Pastor Dave. He's such a giver and a, such a beautiful, beautiful man. And just, you know, they both give so much to everyone else. David wanted to show him such a beautiful act of humanity. So he asked for a bucket of water and he sat Pastor Dave down on the stage and then washed his feet. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just the most beautiful thing. And, and to watch um, Pastor Dave's face just melt in this, like, it was like us, like the, the, can, the, the humanity and the kindness, like it's overwhelming. And the people in the audience were just so overwhelmed. There was such a connection. Mm. And it also made you think it didn't matter that there's maybe 1% of people or whatever percentage there is of us that are, you know, seeing obviously what's going on. Um, it felt in those kind of moments that there is enough love and enough connection, enough humanity in that room that you could smash anything. Yeah. And that's what we came away with and the generosity. And uh, uh, I, I think the takeaway, the, the, we make the question hard, but it isn't. Yeah. Right. We, we actually know the answer. The answer is that, um, you know, have, have a person who you're not familiar with to dinner. Um, you know, if you see somebody struggling and, and people say, oh, but these are too simple and too trite or whatever else. And, and my, my response is, no, the, the reason why the system broke is because we let the state intermediate humanity. We let the state come in and do the things mm, which were, you know, caring for the sick or caring for the infirm or caring for the homeless or caring for this or caring for that. We let the state intermediate our humanity. And now we wonder why we don't have humanity. Well, yeah. take it back, right? I mean, if you see yes. a thing that you can do now, start there. And as I've said many times, the next step will unfold, yeah. right? I think... I think we make a mistake of saying, well, what's the giant strategic plan? <laughs> the giant strategic plan is, are you ready for this? Tomorrow morning, stop being an ass. <laughs> Start doing something beautiful. Yeah. And that may be pay for the coffee for the person behind you in the line. Or it may mean like we used to do, and we still do a lot of times when we go out to eat, surprise somebody's table with you picked up their check. And we make it abundantly clear. And we do this so many times. And we say to the restaurant, say, we didn't do this. Just tell somebody that this was their moment of kindness. That was it. The restaurant can get the credit. The proprietor can get the credit. We don't care. Mm -hmm. Just do a thing. And here's the thing. If you want to know why, for example, this past week was such a huge success. It was a huge success because I still get up every morning. I put my pants on one leg at a time. I don't levitate into them. I don't have a staff that puts my pants on. You know, I don't have a staff that, you know, obviously you can, I'm wearing black so you can't see the wrinkles. I didn't iron this shirt before the show, um, you know, and, but what, what made it work was the people from all over the country who came because they know that if they showed up, we would hug them. We'd sit at a picnic on the grass with them. And, and it turns out, I mean, people don't understand this. It turns out that by these, what appear to be small acts of kindness and of fellowship and of fraternity and, and camaraderie, these small acts have a greater than scale effect Yes. When, when you just access kindness. And the funniest thing is, I mean, how many people... Oh my gosh, we can take a selfie with you. And uh, cool. not only can you, we'll hold the camera. Like I had this lovely person who was very short and very short armed, who's desperately trying to get a selfie. And I was like, your arms are short. Mine are longer. Let me take mm -hmm. your camera. Like, but it was those kinds of things. And, and people criticize me all the time saying, well, that that's not a big plan. And I respond, yes, it's the biggest plan. The yeah. biggest plan we can do is start living the world we'd like to manifest. Yeah. How would you like? And to if we're it? waiting for that to come in some sort of mass agenda, where you know every bit's worked out and we know who's the new head of this or that or the other thing, and which establishments are we going to tear down and which ones are we going to put up? If you're waiting for that, forget it. You're the problem. Get into the human life, get into the synchronization of dancing with nature. And before long, what you'll find out is the system changed and we didn't even know we did it.
Yeah, beautiful, David. Yeah. I've been trying to sort of communicate similar things of like stop living in fear and fe in fear of yes. death and live Thanks the life you know you came yeah. here to live and and things will happen around us yeah. the new earth as it's meant to be and it's also good to know david now i know why you've chosen the background it looks like something in a church because you know if this speaking gig ever falls through you know that you can go and work for the, <laughs> with the bar. Well, so, so no but let me let me acknowledge <laughs> the artist behind me um this this is my stylized adaptation of one of the most beautiful alabaster carvings in Amnabad, India. Mm. This is actually the tree of life in the mosque in Amnabad. And the reason why I use this with the integral accounting colors in, in, in the wheel set behind it, the reason I use this image is homage to when I was in Amnabad. One of the very first times was during the Hindu and Muslim um, clashes that led to the genocide of, of thousands of people in Gujarat. And I actually witnessed some of the brutality and the murder right under this image. Um, but I thought how sad it was that under the tree of life, we had decided to let the division of faiths decide to kill each other. Um, so for me, when I see this image, it's a constant reminder of the beauty of the Islamic carvers who one day carved this into the, 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 the relief in the mosque. And by the way, if you look at the actual carving and, and look at the Tree of Life in the mosque in Amnabad, it is breathtaking. And so what I've done is I've actually, in homage to the lives that were lost during the, the Muslim and Hindu riots, uh, we've used an adaptation of that beautiful piece of artwork to say that humanity once did have a picture that was beautiful, and it's time for us to come back to that beautiful picture. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful, David. And let's not repeat the mistakes of the past. Yeah, exactly. Learn from that. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful note to end on, Pat. Have you got something else you'd like to? Add? Yeah. Uh, I, one thing that you've reminded me of, and it speaks into exactly what you've been saying just now. <clears throat> we had the bushfires here, as you know, um, almost two years back, <coughs> and on the fifteenth of January, twenty twenty, I saw a photograph of a man by the name of Farron Turlich sitting in front of his devastated New South Wales um, farm, uh, which has all been burnt out. And his, the despair in his countenance just broke my heart. And so I went searching for him online, found him in a dairy register and rang, introduced myself and said, you know, I would like to be ringing you until you no longer need to hear from me. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, I love that. So I've been ringing Farron Turlich every day ever since. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we are poles apart in terms of our interests and um, design of our life. However, um, he was coughing for about three months. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying to him, have you been from the smoke? And I said, have you been to the doctor? No, you've been to the doctor? No. And then after about two or three months, I said, you still haven't been to the doctor, have you? And he, he got a bit tetchy. And he said, no, I haven't, Pat. And I said, well, I'm going to put my matron's hat on now. <laughs> and, That's um, it. <laughs> and March I did, you off. I did a little nursery rant. And he killed himself laughing. And we <laughs> both laughed together. And that was the cementing moment. Mm. Yep. No, nice. we, we, we I love had that. we had relationship that was building, um, and it was never about coaching or uh, anything other than I wanted to have his back in a way that I would have loved my own back to be had. That's it. Mm? That's perfect. and what a what a precious relationship. Now he knows. He knows my son by default and my grandchildren and <laughs> we have this broader connection and I had an intention that I'm going to go down there and run a grieving program. Well, of course, COVID hit and so that didn't happen. But I've seen just what you were talking about um, with the feet bathing. Yeah. Um, we He went and sat. He's never done this in his life, but with much coercion from myself, he went and sat in on the side of a river on his way home took his boots off and put his feet in the water yeah. and, and we sat there together and I'm just prattling away and it was like this is amazing 
Yeah. This is Patch Adams talks about communing with others and yeah. it's that space. Yeah. Well, and it's yeah, out of that. It, it is out of that, Pat, that, that the new will be born. Mm. Um, I reminded people on a number of the speeches that I've given recently and a number of the shows that I've done recently that if we go back to 1774 to 1776 here in the U.S., and we look at what gave rise to the what became the experiment of America. If we look at what that was, it ultimately was a very small number of people, as few as 16, who actually said, you know what? We've tried to have our grievances addressed through the nor nor normal channels. You know, we've tried to do it the way we've been told to do it, and it hasn't worked. And at a certain point in time, you draw a line in the sand and you say, you know what? It's not going to work. It's not going to work to try to fix a system where the very rules that we were told were the rules of the game are not being honored by the referees of the game. And so where we are now is, you know what? If the referees are not calling the game, then it's time for us to actually maybe walk off the pitch and play a different game. <laughs> and... Um, uh, you know what I see, and there you go. I said pitch. Did you hear Indeed. that? Cricket You've infected me. Um, You've infected me. Oh my you. gosh! I actually <laughs> sound like a Aussie, Aussie all of a sudden. Uh, but it's it, it is it's time to uh, pack up your your bat and your wickets, whatever and you have ball. in your ball, you and, uh, and 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 just and just you know that we know how to play the game that's stumps. called humanity, yep. and and yep. it's time that we actually start living it. And as we live it, people will recognize that. And as we get recognized, we'll By continue example, to build momentum. That's the and, true infection. And and, Infect and that. before long, before long, the inevitable consequence of humanity will overwhelm all of the forces that seek to destroy it. Yeah. Bring yeah. it on. Bring it on, yes. brother. There you go. <laughs> Definitely. I'm so grateful to have manifested myself on this plane at the same time as you guys. Yes, yes. same. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So much, gratitude. So David, much gratitude. I, I want to often in interviews such as this, the, the host will say, are there any final words you'd like to say? Well, I'd like to specifically invite you to say specific words in <laughs> um, <laughs> rather than what might be your own thought um, in future dreaming. Um, and this, this line has stayed with me ever since I first heard it you talk about the prayer of the flower yeah would you would you just leave us with that sentence please yeah yeah i will but i'm going to do something before i do that i'm going to share with you um the thing that pastor dave and i co-read at the end of my presentation in yuba city because i want i want to set the energetic tone for for the prayer of the flower using this particular prayer and this was my um, adaptation of the prayer that preceded the first gathering of the Continental Congress in Carpenter's Hall, which, by the way, foretold of decades of bloodshed and violence and horror, which is what that prayer was. And I often said, you know, we would have been better off had that prayer never been prayed because it was an invocation for the 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 horrible, horrible loss of life and and fortune that followed. And so what I did was I rewrote the prayer of of what should have been prayed at the original carpenters hall and i actually had the good fortune in 2011 to actually state this particular thing in carpenters hall which was actually very cool mm. but here's here's what i i said led by humanity's unquenchable light we pledge to live as stewards of our sanctuary earth to honor the inalienable value of the creativity intrinsic to all to orient our actions to the removal of barriers of access and opportunity, to define our wealth by our character rather than our artifacts, and to fully live in abundant grace in a spirit of tolerance and mercy so that we dwellers of the earth may be embraced in the illumination of everlasting glory. Mm. And that feels so apropos to lead into the, prayer of the flower which i talk about in future dreaming which is i say let my petals open widely 
Let the light shine on every bit of me so that in me, the bee and the hummingbird and the insects find their nectar, they find their respite, they find their place so that in the essence of me fully shining, everything that is life finds within that expression their fullness and their expression and their nourishment of life. Because it is in when we become the fullness of who we are meant to be, that every single bit of us is fully expended for the service of every single other thing in the system. And by doing that, we ourselves are fed to live into our next generation when the flower once again returns to the seed and once again emerges from the ground in the spring. Mm. So beautiful. That's the, the meaning of custodianship right there, David. Thank you. So beautiful yes. message to end with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. Uh, a Thank pleasure and a joy. And I know, <laughs> I know this is going to be received with such gratitude. Mm. So many, so many um, are waiting. <laughs> there you week, go. Well, you know, to hear Kim and words. I, Kim and I long for the day that we can return and visit you guys be once again in the loving embrace of the unmasked and unaltered <laughs> and undefiled Australians who we know and love. Absolutely. Can't wait. We'll yes. smuggle you in. Yeah. If we <laughs> Thanks guys. So uh, much. Love. Thank, thank you. you. Lots of love. Thanks Pat thank as you. well. It's been beautiful to do this with yes, you. Yes. You too, Denby. Thank you. Thank Until you. Bye-bye.